Welcome to the uh, afternoon session, the first of which uh, deals with a really important subject of uh, catheter-associated urinary tract infections. And my job is only to introduce the speakers, which I will do straight away. We have two uh, eminent speakers today. Um, Dr. Sandra Wilkes from Southampton University has been doing quite comprehensive studies into how bacteria adheres to uh, long-term indwelling catheters over a number of years. And she's looked at a new device called a device called Euroshield, which um, emits an ultrasound wave, a low frequency, low intensity ultrasound wave that actually prevents the bacteria from adhering to the catheter surface and has many other benefits as well. So she's going to talk about her independent studies of that. And then we're going to have some experience from uh, Frimley Hospital from uh, the use of the product on a number of patients who have recurrent uh, catheter infections. So it's going to be uh, quite an interesting breakthrough. The product was actually introduced a year ago into the NHS at this conference, and we took advice from NHS Improvement, which is to say, go and do your randomized controlled trial, which we actually have completed and it's been published, very successful, highly significant results. We also did patient studies, we've done the laboratory studies, and York uh, Health Economics are now doing uh, the final touches to the cost-benefit analysis. So everything is sort of in place for this year to uh, transition the product into use within the NHS. So we'll be very interested in your feedback on the product. So first I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Sandra Wilkes from Southampton University. Good afternoon. I'm a microbiologist and I work on biofilms, that's my main interest, um, at Southampton University and within the National Biofilms Innovation Centre. And as Trevor said, I've been doing a program of work over the last several years looking at understanding better how biofilms form on urinary catheters and what they're actually composed of. And as part of that, we've been running some tests on the Euroshield device. So just to start off, I, I should say I work across the departments of health sciences and um, biological sciences, and so I'm working with healthcare professionals all the time as well. So a little bit of background information. Why are we interested in biofilms anyway, and what are they? Biofilms are groups of bacteria um, that will adhere to a surface or an interface, and they form a really quite complex structure. This is not a simple individual bacteria sticking to a surface. They form this sort of 3D architecture, and they surround themselves with a matrix that can be sorry about this, um, that can be formed of things like polysaccharides, proteins, lipids, and even extracellular DNA. So they have this kind of scaffolding around them. And they have this sort of open but ordered structure where you have nutrient channels sort of running throughout them. So you can start to think of it almost as a multicellular structure rather than individual bacteria. And what does this do? Well, the whole structure itself provides resistance from chemical and mechanical attack, as well as the bacteria behaving differently within the biofilm. So this means when you apply antibiotics, you need a much higher concentration to break through and attack that biofilm. And they can act as a reservoir for pathogens. Why are we interested in catheters? Well, we've known about the importance of biofilms in clinical samples for a long time. We've all just had lunch. If you run your tongue over your teeth, you'll probably feel a little bit of a layer. That's the beginnings of the plaque biofilm that we're all familiar with. The same happens on the surface of any medical device. And so the catheter has the potential to form biofilms on both the external surface and the internal lumen. And we now know that this can really contribute to the risk of UTIs and blockages as well. And added to that, certainly in long-term catheter users, you get this um, problem of both infections and blockages often reoccurring and happening over and over again, even after repeated antibiotic treatments. If we think of the blockages, we're mainly looking at colonization 
by a species called Proteus mirabilis, which causes a rapid increase in the pH. And you get all this crystal formation, which causes these encrustations and total catheter blockage. So what are we doing? I'm not going to go into this in any detail at all. If anyone would like information, please feel free to come and speak to me afterwards. But we have um, a patented microscope system which allows us to look at large and solid and curved surfaces directly at high magnification without needing to stain or label the bacteria. And this helps us really see that overall structure and architecture. So first of all, what do some clean, unused catheter surfaces look like? These are our EDIC, that's the microscope that we use, images of, on the left-hand side, an unused silicone catheter, and on the right-hand side, a hydrogel latex catheter. And in both cases, you can see that the surfaces are most definitely not smooth. From a bacterial point of view, this is great. They're covered in places that they can attach and start forming these biofilms. So they are not smooth surfaces at all and provide perfect environment for biofilm formation. If we start looking at how the biofilms form, these are just some example images using E. coli. So these are E. coli on catheters in the laboratory in an artificial urine medium. And on the um, top left-hand side, we have an EDIC image showing this very disordered surface. And hopefully, you can just make out that there are some areas that are darker than others. And if we then use specific bacterial stains, we can match the bacteria to those areas. So that's where we're starting to see biofilm formation. And in the case of E. coli, which is not a strong biofilm former, you're still getting extensive biofilm colonization of the surface. When you look at something like Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which loves to form a biofilm, you get a really rapid biofilm forming. So here, on the top left-hand side, we've got the situation after only six hours. And what you can see here is a thick mat of Pseudomonas covering the whole surface with just a few channels running in between. After 24 hours, on the right-hand side, we've got total coverage. There's no exposed catheter left. But then the interesting bit, and it's an important feature of biofilms, within another 24 hours, you're looking at more of a mosaic structure. So you've got areas where the bacteria have removed. And this is an important aspect of biofilms. It's a, it's a very dynamic structure. So you get areas that slough away and allow recolonization of any surface and the catheters in particular. I mentioned Proteus and the problems of um, blockages and encrustations. And Proteus form a crystalline biofilm. And here we've got some examples again. I'm not going to go through these in detail. But on the top left-hand side, we've got the situation after only a couple of days' exposure to Proteus. You get total coverage of the catheter, and you get a layer of crystals forming on the top. After four days, you get a huge amount of microcrystalline uh, production. And that's what's shown in the bottom two images. So you get this diffuse crystalline material that's called apatite, and you get these defined struvite crystals. As we leave them longer, we can start looking a bit more about what this means. We've always thought of these crystals as being a purely chemical process. But when you look at them in detail, you find that the crystals and those encrustations are actually just providing another surface for the biofilm. So here, we've got some struvite crystals in the, in the center of each image, and they're actually covered in bacteria. So again, it's building layer upon layer of this very dynamic, very complex system. And that's what I really want to stress. It's a very, very complex environment and situation that we're trying to deal with. These are all on silicone catheters, but we also see the same with hydrogel-coated catheters. So the hydrogel does not prevent this from happening. So what kind of approaches can we use? Well, over the years, there's been lots of different um, approaches applied to look at antimicrobial catheters. 
Many have uh, resorted to using impregnated or coated materials, such as adding antibiotics, or materials such as silver. And I expect you're all familiar with the idea of the silver-coated catheters. And with any of these kind of approaches, we tend to find lots of problems. So the bit of data I'm showing here, and again, a very simple take-home message. In the three graphs, we've got E. coli forming biofilms over four days. And the first graph is on silicone on the top left-hand side. Then we've got hydrogen latex. And then we've got a silver-coated catheter. And all you need to notice is that there's no difference between any of them. The biofilm forms the same way. The big issue with any of these active material type approaches is, of course, the potential to form antimicrobial resistance, which we know is a major issue. And it's always going to be difficult with any chemical approach not for that not to happen eventually. And resistance develops extremely quickly within the biofilm environment. What about mechanical methods? Well, we know there are things like uh, bladder washouts, uh, which can be used. But again, bacteria are very good at withstanding the sheer forces against the, uh, the catheter itself. So while you may clear some of those encrustations, you've probably still got that layer of bacteria below. We've just carried out a lab study using uh, the Euroshield device, and this generates a low-frequency um, surface acoustic wave, very low-frequency ultrasound, which clips on, uh, the actuator clips onto the base of the catheter, the outside surface, and the waves are transmitted along the length of the catheter, both on the external surface and the internal lumen. We've been testing this in um, a, a couple of model lab setups, and one of these has included um, a laboratory bladder model. Now, this has been used in many studies over the years, and it's basically a, a glass vessel which is mimicking the bladder. It allows us to keep it at uh, the correct temperature, and you can insert the catheter, inflate the balloon. We use a physiologically correct artificial urine medium, and then we can sample the catheter. So it's a very controlled system. I'm not going to go through many results, but these are just a few of the results that we've got. Here, we are showing the percentage reduction in biofilm formation on Euroshield treated catheters compared to an untreated control. And what we're seeing is that after 48 hours on the top left-hand side with E. coli, we're getting a close to 100%. It actually works out at around 99% reduction in biofilm formation in this sample. For Proteus, we found that we could achieve that level sometimes, but depending on the positioning of the area of the catheter we were uh, sampling from, that would sometimes fall to around 50%. And with Pseudomonas, the results were more variable, with certain sections getting almost that 98, 99%, but then other areas showing no difference. Now, it's important to consider several points here. First of all, we have that heterogeneous nature of the biofilms. It changes all the way down the catheter, um, so we have to bear that in mind. But also, we have to consider our lab model. We're using a very high concentration of bacteria, far higher than we would find in a person, um, because we are incubating the bacteria, so they're growing very quickly. So any reduction is a really good result. And we also are lacking all the host, the human immune response factors, which will be working in conjunction as well. So this is very much preliminary work. So just really to conclude my part of this, this talk, I really wanted to stress how complex and how difficult treating biofilms is. So bacteria will attach incredibly rapidly, certainly within a couple of hours, but actually we find them attaching within minutes. 
And you've got this other material. You're not just dealing with bacteria. So you've got this glue, this other structural material that's holding the whole system together. Those complex crystalline biofilms can form very quickly. And once they start forming, you can see how you're, you're basically trying to get through all of that material. It's very difficult to clear. There are alternative control methods, but anything based on chemicals or active compounds, we have to be mindful of the risks of resistance development. With the Euroshield, we have got variable results in the lab, in our flow system, but we are providing an extremely worst case scenario. And in some cases, we were getting a good reduction, so up to around 99% removal and reduction in colonization. There are various explanations for this. I've mentioned about the immune system, and certainly that's likely to be a major factor. But also, it's important to remember with any lab study, in the natural environment, biofilms are rarely composed of just one bacterial species. There'll be a whole range of species. So we can start thinking of the urinary microbiome. So what's there? And certainly, all the recent studies are showing us that urine isn't sterile, as we've always thought, and definitely not for long-term catheter users. So we need to look at whether this device is disrupting a, um, the, the, sort of the community structure of those biofilms, and whether it's actually encouraging removal of pathogenic species. And we are about to do a study linked to that. So as I say, we're about to do a small microbiome study. And this will also involve looking directly on some patient catheters. So we can start seeing how accurate our model is as well. And this is being funded through the National Biofilms Innovation Center, um, where we're trying to bring some of the techniques that we use in our research to help with product development and industry moving forward. And just to finish, on my part, I just wanted to leave you with this short movie that I hope will work, where we are traveling through a crystalline biofilm. So hopefully you'll see that we're coming into focus now. And as we move down, we've surrounded by all this diffuse crystalline material with these struvite crystals covered in bacteria. It's a really complex environment. It is not like a basic bacterial cell very difficult to treat. And now I will pass over back to Trevor. Thank you, Sandra. <coughs> Sorry. Thank you, Sandra. Uh, so during the year, we've had the opportunity of visiting a number of trusts in the UK, both uh, acute trusts and community-based trusts, to, to get some patients who regularly are affected uh, by urinary tract infections caused by long-dwelling catheters. And we now have uh, Jane Miles with us, who's a specialist nurse in urology from Frimley Hospital, who's going to give us her own experiences of using the Euroshield device. Jane. Hi. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is me. I'm the urology nurse specialist for benign disease at Frimley Park, and I've been in post for 23 years. Uh, to be perfectly honest, this is the first product that I've come across that has really sparked my imagination and my enthusiasm for about 15 years, because it actually seems to work. So I've been asked to give you a little bit of my patient's experiences with this, condition, uh, with this uh, product. And first of all, we've seen about 10 patients. The blue is uh, the patients prior to using the Euroshield. And the red is post. So you can see straight away that there's a big, big difference with their experiences with infections, with blockages and changes, with having bladder washouts, and in pain relief. 
I know this is uh, prevention of infection, but when patients are dependent upon a catheter for their well-being, having regular blockages, having lots of bladder spasm and pain just makes your life miserable. Um, and it, I would go so far with one of my patients, which I'll talk about later, um, extremely um, miserable. So my first patient is Claire. Claire is 40 years old. She has complex problems in that she has um, psychiatric problems um, and she has a history of Eros Danlos, which is a connective tissue problem. She's got osteoporosis and she is wheelchair bound. Prior to um, having the catheter, uh, the Eurishield last year, between January and October, she had eight different courses of antibiotics. She had a bladder washout under anaesthetic um, at the beginning of December, and she had bladder stones removed. And she had some Botox therapy. We changed the catheter, and the first Eurashield shield was attached on the 5th of November. Now, the strange thing about um, the Eurashield shield is we've had a couple of problems in that sometimes we've had battery failure because you have to charge the battery up. But those failures actually proved that the, the device works because patients experience problems when the Eurashield shield had stopped working properly. After the, um, the Eurashield in this case actually broke and it wouldn't charge on the 14th of November, and she had um, bad bladder spasms, this is her words, and a lot of sediment, while I didn't have the Eurashield on my catheter. She was sent a new one, and since then she has not had any problems with infection, she's not had any antibiotics, and she's not had any blockages. She's feeling a lot happier. Right, I think that's the one. <laughs> so she's got a peg feed as well, I forgot to say that. Patient two. Roz is a 65-year-old lady. She has a high spinal injury and remitting and relapsing multiple sclerosis. She's wheelchair dependent and she has a suprapubic catheter. When I first contacted Roz about having uh, taken part in the trial, she said, Jane, I've got to the point of contacting Dignitas. Now, Roz is a very devout Christian. I've known her for quite a number of years, and for her to actually say that, I knew that things had got to quite a, 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 a really bad level for her. She's multi-resistant to antibiotics. She's also multi-allergic to a lot of um, medication. Since she's had, well, the day I saw her when she came in to have it fitted, she, you all know the waxy sort of appearance that people have when they're really poorly, pale, shiny skin. She came in a month later and she had a normal complexion. She had a smile on her face, which I wasn't expecting. And she'd had uh, reduced pain, reduced infections, and reduced blockages. By the end of the three-month trial, she reported that she now had a much easier time with her bowel management because she wasn't getting the abdominal spasm. So from not just from an infection prevention point of view, but from a whole case scenario of a patient's quality of life, which I'm sure you will all agree with me, is priceless. When they've got a good quality of life, you can cope with a lot more things going on if you are pain-free 
and you haven't got worries. My final patient is Nigel. He's a 61-year-old gentleman with progressive MS. He has a suprapubic catheter and is wheelchair dependent. I will read, if you don't mind, um, just a little email that his wife sent me. Nigel was diagnosed with MS in 1974, one year after we were married, and so we have really fought this illness together, coping with all its ghastly twists and turns, seeing him going from a healthy, extreme, extremely capable and full of life man to now being wheelchair bound and with basically only his right arm and right hand having any control. For many years, Nigel had to self-catheterize until suprapubic was installed some 15 years ago. Obviously, there are always issues with secondary progressive MS and the constant gradual decline in Nigel's condition. But really, for the last few years, it's the UTIs and catheter blockages that have caused us most grief as they arrive unexpectedly and have such a devastating effect. The temperature associated with the UTI rapidly switches Nigel off. He becomes unable to do anything and in a short time is totally limp and unresponsive. It's actually quite frightening for me and over the years I've tried to cope but more recently Nigel has had to be taken into hospital as it is impossible to cope with him in the home situation by myself. From the above paragraph you will understand just why we are so amazed at the results of using Eurishield. Since last October Nigel has not had his weekly bladder washout which was performed by the district nurse in our home. He is off all prophylactic antibiotics, having before been on a rolling three-month use of three different antibiotics in an attempt to stop him becoming immune to a specific antibiotic. He has not suffered a UTI. He has not had a catheter blockage when often the weekly washout would cause the district nurse to have to actually change the catheter as the washout wasn't successful. There have been no trips by ambulance required to A&E to change a block catheter overnight. In general, his whole um, quality of life has improved. And for somebody with a um, progressive MS, as, as Nigel's got, you know, every little thing that can help is a bonus. And when somebody has got a catheter in that's constantly blocking, they lose confidence in having the catheter, they're afraid to go out because they're afraid it'll block and they'll end up in A&E. So from, I've, I've now seen uh, 10 patients, we, we're on our 10th patient trial in this product now. Uh, the only support I've had from Eurishield is actually providing the devices. Um, I haven't been paid to come up and speak to you today. I just am so enthusiastic and I really wish um, more people would take this on board and think of it as a, a way forward in improving our patients' quality of life, reducing infections. Thank you.